as you have those Bibles, I want to encourage you, turn with me into the, your Bible to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28 is where we will be today. If you're not familiar with where that's at in your Bible, Matthew is, in the, first, is the first book of your New Testament. Uh, you can go right past the first 39 books of the Bible, which is all considered the Old Testament, and there you're going to hit a couple of guys' names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all gospel accounts about the life of Jesus, the good news of his life, his ministry, his teaching, the miracles that he did, ultimately his death, and what we're here to celebrate this morning, his resurrection. So before we jump into this, as you are turning there, there's a historical thing that we do here at the Call Church. It's not uh, just only us. It is something that the church has done for years, many, many years, and we're going to keep their tradition. Uh, so what would happen in church services as the pastor or the minister would stand up to communicate, he would say, he is risen on Easter morning, and the people would say, he is risen indeed. Some of you know this, so we're going to do that this morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now say it like you really mean it. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. And so uh, you may be here new going, what is wrong with these people? So uh, we are celebrating the highlight of Christianity. As a matter of fact, Today is like the Super Bowl. It really is the Super Bowl of Christianity. It is the World Cup, if you're a soccer fan, of Christianity. It is the World Series of Christianity. This is what everything hinges upon. It is the biggest day. We celebrate this every year as this moment when Jesus came, he died, and then he ultimately rose again. And the amazing thing is, I know as I say Super Bowl, how many of you 49ers fans in here right now that are bummed about what happened? So here's the crazy thing about what we celebrate in Christianity every year. We know who wins, and he's, a, he's on our team, right? He's the guy that we are rooting for. It's Jesus Christ, and he wins. And so today, what I want to do is spend some time talking with you. I want to do four things. One is walk through the story in the book of Matthew of what transpired that Sunday morning when the women came to the tomb, what they observed, and what they saw there. And then out of that, what I want to spend the rest of our time doing is three key things. First, is, is there really an examining, is there really evidence that Jesus Christ died and ultimately, more importantly, rose from the dead? Because here's the bottom line. If, if that is true, it changes everything. But if it is not, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if Jesus didn't rise, then there is no resurrection from the dead. And the truth of the matter is, our faith as Christians is futile, and we should be pitied more than all mankind. Is there evidence that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead? And secondly, if it is true that he did, what difference does that make? And then lastly, what I want to spend our time talking about is three responses that you and I have to Jesus Christ and the resurrection. And all three of those will represent one of us in this room. And my hope and my prayer is that as we navigate through this today, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and experience what he has come to offer you, that today would be a life-changing day for you. So we are in the book of Matthew, chapter 28. Hopefully you've found yourself there. If you're still looking for it, just ask your neighbor. They've got to help you there at church. So uh, just ask them real quick. Matthew 28, starting at verse 1. The resurrection story according to Matthew. It says these words. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Now, I just want to pause there for just a brief moment because we have to realize it's a Sunday morning. Jesus died on that Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he was laid in a tomb, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then they had the day, the Sabbath day. And then that led into where they, they didn't do much. They were, it was a day of rest for them. And then on Sunday morning, we see in the Gospel of John, early in the morning, the women go to the tomb while it was still dark. And you've got to just take for a moment the suffering, the pain, what they are experiencing. It has been a dark and a desperate couple of days for them. And there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. What's fascinating is when Jesus died, there was an earthquake. When he rises, there is an earthquake. An angel comes and rolls back the stone. And I just want to let you know, this isn't the angel that you typically think of, of the chubby little baby wearing a diaper and flapping around with wings, right? This is, a, this is an angel that is going to terrify people. 
As a matter of fact, it says this in verse 3, his appearance was like lightning. The last couple of weekends, we've had some pretty awesome storms. I don't know if you went out and watched the night sky as the lightning just lit it up. That's what he's saying here. Matthew's saying his appearance, his countenance was like bright lightning and his clothes were white as snow, whiter than some of your teeth in here today. It is just beaming, this angel. And out of that, this is what ends up happening. The guards are terrified, and they are so afraid of him that they shook. They shook, and they became like dead men. They, they, they passed out. And then the angel, and I don't know what the angel would have done in that moment. Rolling the stone away, they see him, and he goes, boo, and they all, they all fall. I, 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 we just don't know. So the angel says to the women, hey, 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 ladies, do not be afraid, for I know that you were looking for Jesus, who was crucified, and he is not here he is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with what? Joy. It is what we are celebrating today. Joy. This is a joyous day. They ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly, now Jesus meets them. And he says, greetings. They came to him, they clasped his free feet, and they worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, as we embark on your word and on your truth, and we celebrate what you did, that you conquered the grave, Jesus, that you conquered death, and that you conquered sin, we just give all glory and honor to you this morning. And Father, I pray in a way that only you can that you would speak into our lives, that you would touch hearts this morning, that your word would come to life by the power of your spirit. And God, we would walk away different people, for some of us more encouraged, for some of us with a joyous heart, for some of us with appreciation like we've never had. And God, maybe for some of us today, that 2024, March 31st, would be a day of life-changing transformation that changes everything. So, Lord, we invite you here into this time to do your work, to accomplish your purpose, and we want you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. These three evidences for a resurrection that I want to walk through. The first one is Exhibit A, if we can get that up on the slide. The execution. Would you just say that with me? The execution. It's what really happened. It's what's leading up to this moment. Because for most of us on Easter, we run immediately to the tomb, the risen Savior, and we celebrate that. But we've got to go back to Friday and the events of Friday. And if you weren't here with us on Friday night, and I, I, let me just recapture what has transpired up in these last couple of days leading up to this point where we read in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus has been in an upper room with his disciples. He's been sharing them for several times what's about to come, that he's going to die, and on the third days he, he's going to rise again. They're not quite getting it. He goes to a garden area where he prays with his disciples. They spend some time together. They're really sleeping while he is in agony. He's crying out to his father saying, if this can, cannot happen, if there's any way that I can avoid this, let it be, but not my will but yours be done. And in that, after three times of praying, the guards come, they arrest Jesus, he stands on trial before the religious leaders of the day, the high priest. Then he stands on trial before the governmental officials. And then he is sentenced to death. And they would typically take a victim in a flogging situation and extend their hands onto a post. And usually two Roman soldiers on each side would have whips. These whips were long leather strands, oftentimes with pieces of bone and metal sharp objects that have been attached to the ends of these whips, and each one would take turns whipping the victim. We know that this happened to Jesus to the point where it was excruciating, oftentimes ripping off flesh, bone, all sorts of things. And Jesus is then led to carry his cross to where he is going to be crucified. The beating was so bad that he couldn't carry his cross. As some of us know, a man by the name of Simon is asked to carry the cross for him, and there Jesus is a Nailed to this cross, he is pushed up onto this where ultimately most victims would die of suffocation as they sat in agony because the weight of the body would collapse the lungs to where they couldn't get any air. And if you're familiar with the story, they're trying to speed up the death process and the soldiers come by and they examine Jesus and they're going by to break the legs of the victims. And the reason for that was so that the individual couldn't keep pushing up to get air into their lungs and ultimately would suffocate. And when they came to Christ, they realized he was already dead 
A Roman centurion took a spear and jabbed it through his side where blood and water flowed out. Jesus had died. There's no doubt about that. As a matter of fact, as a Roman soldier who was there in charge of the execution, if you didn't kill that individual, you then became that individual. As a Roman soldier, you would make sure that that individual was dead. And they did. Jesus had died. And actually, if you go back just the chapter before in Matthew 27, if you've got the Bibles open, I'd encourage you to turn there. It says this in verse 57 and following, just leading up to what actually transpired after Jesus had died on the cross. It says, as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph was a man who was part of the religious council. He was a very, very well-known religious guy who put his faith in Christ, also a man by the name of Nicodemus, if you're familiar with him. Joseph took the body. He wrapped it in clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock, and he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and he went away. And then Matthew offers this information. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. It's really important to remember because we're going to talk about that in just a moment as well. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus grab the body of Jesus and they bury him because he's dead. It really did take place. The second exhibit is this. It's the empty tomb. Would you say that with me? The empty tomb. So we got up onto this scene. We were just talking about this in Matthew 28 where the women come and, and uh, they run to the tomb. They look and the angel says, hey, do not be afraid. Jesus did exactly what he said. Come and see. Look inside. And we cannot get away from the truth that there is an empty tomb. Jesus' body has never been found. There are other religious leaders and other, uh, other sects of religion that, uh, yes, you can go and you can find Muhammad's gravesite. You can find these religious leaders. Jesus, you cannot find his body. It was an empty tomb. And there's a couple of thoughts and ideas of what individuals have said of why the tomb was empty. And no matter what people say, Jesus' body has never been found. It will never be found. And some have said, well, they just all went to the wrong tomb. Did you catch what we just read? Mary and Mary were sitting watching where Jesus was laid. They would have known exactly where to go. Joseph of Arimathea would have known exactly where to go. Nicodemus would have known exactly where to go. There were Roman soldiers that we're going to talk about in just a moment that they would have known right where the, if it was the wrong tomb and people were just mistaken on the it would have been easily brought to their attention. But then something else comes up that people try and say, it was a stolen body. The disciples came and stole the body, which Matthew tells us exactly that that is what people were saying. If you read this in verse 62, it says this, the next day, the one after the preparation day, so this would have been that Saturday, the Friday after Jesus had died. The chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said that after three days he will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and they may steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be greater than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, now make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. These Roman soldiers were there to cover it because the religious leaders knew Jesus had talked about it. And these guys are here protecting the tomb. And, and, and you'll, you'll see later what the story ends up being that they come up with and they say, oh, the disciples came in the middle of the evening while the, these Roman soldiers were asleep, stole the body, and, and that's where Jesus is. But, but we're going to address that in a moment. The reality is there is an empty tomb. Now, here's the thing. Jesus dying on the cross, historical fact, people wouldn't disagree with that. An empty tomb, yeah, nobody's ever found the body. But what changes everything? You can come up with all sorts of explanations for those two things, except the third thing is this. Exhibit C, the eyewitnesses. Would you say that with me? The eyewitnesses. This is what it says. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. Oh, yeah, the tomb is empty, and we saw an angel, and that's incredible stuff, except all of a sudden, suddenly Jesus shows up on the scene. Greetings. And they came to him, and they clasped his feet, and they worshiped him. Just the empty tomb itself doesn't change anything, but people started seeing Jesus. And we know the stories throughout the scripture. He shows himself to women first, which back in that day, 
back in that day, women's testimony, and I'm not trying to be sexist, but it's just how it was, was not highly elevated. It was not highly regarded. Why on earth, if somebody was really trying to prove that Jesus did rise from, why would they start with a story saying, hey, he went to women, unless it really did happen that way. And then he starts to appear to two disciples as they are walking on the road to Emmaus, and then he shows up to the disciples themselves. And then if you remember the story, there's one guy, Thomas, right? And he forgets, a bit. he's like, I'm not believing unless I see him. And then Jesus comes on the scene and says, where's that jerk Thomas? No, he doesn't say that, but he says, where's Thomas at? I'm going to show him, touch my head. You can see me. And he shows himself. As a matter of fact, Jesus shows himself time and time again. And if we read Paul's account in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, should be read up on the screen for you. It says these words, for what I received, I also pass along to you as first importance, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. When that was written, most of them were still living, though some had fallen asleep. Jesus shows up on the scene, not just to one or two at a time, not to say, oh, they hallucinated or they imagined, over 500 at the same time. And then after that verse, in verse 7, it says, and then he appeared to James. And you may say, well, how come James is so special? James is the half-brother of Jesus. Have you ever thought what it would be like to be the half-brother of Jesus? It would stink, right? Your parents would always be like, how come you can't be more like Jesus? Right, all the time. How come you can't love people like Jesus? How come you just can't be honest like Jesus? I would hate that. That would be the worst, right? And James, the Bible says, clearly did not believe Jesus was who he said he was. And yet, what ends up transpiring after the events of the resurrection, after appearing to him, James becomes the head of the Jerusalem church, proclaiming that Jesus Christ had died and rose from the dead, and he ultimately goes to the grave proclaiming that he's a martyr. Why? Because he was an eyewitness to the accounts of Jesus. And the, the miraculous thing is we are here because of the testimony of those eyewitness people. You think about this, these disciples, these followers, these women, they were all cowering in an upper room. They were afraid of the government officials. They were afraid that this stuff was going to happen to them. And and what ends up transpiring is they become empowered and go out sharing this gospel message, communicating that they believed wholeheartedly that Jesus had died and that he had rose from the dead. As a matter of fact, 10 of the 11 disciples, the remaining disciples, the apostles that are there, all were martyred for their faith, and the other one was exiled to an island, separated from the rest of humanity, all because they stood and said, we believe Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, because what would bring about that kind of change? They had seen it. So what, if, what does this all mean? What if this is all true? I want to just give you a couple of points, and I've only got about three and a half more hours here, so uh, just hang tight with me. We'll get you home for your ham. So uh, Jesus is who he claimed to be. Would you say that with me? Jesus is who he claimed to be. It's what this means. And this is some of the claims that Jesus made. You can read these through, through Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. But one of them in John chapter 11 that is really sticking is this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and I am the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus was more than just a prophet. He was more than just a miracle worker. He was more than just a good guy teaching moral lessons. He was coming to earth and he says these words, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the son of God who came to die for your sins and for mine. The second thing is this, Jesus fulfilled what he came to do. Would you say that with me? Jesus fulfilled what he came to do. What was the mission of Jesus? As a matter of fact, it says this in verse six. The angel says it, he's not here, he is risen. Oh, come on, you guys are supposed to help me out here. Gotcha, mm-mm. We'll try that again, I know I threw that on you. The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. risen. Okay, 50% of you got that. So just as he said he would do, just as he said he would do it. Because you have to understand something if you don't know much about the story of Jesus. Jesus' whole point on coming to earth was not just to do good things. His whole point is he says, he didn't come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many which includes you, and it includes me. Matter of fact, do me a huge favor. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus died for you? Just tell them that right now. Jesus died for you. Jesus fulfilled what he came to do. 
and death could not hold him. He came not only to die, but to rise from the dead. He didn't just come to fix your marriage. He didn't come to fix your family problems, your work issues, your financial crisis. What Jesus ultimately came for was to fix your sin problem. And he did that for you and for me. And when he rose from the dead, he demonstrated that he had the power to do that. As a matter of fact, if you read it in John chapter 2, it says, Jesus says these words, you guys destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it from the dead. And they thought he was talking about the temple, and the temple that he was really talking about was his body. The third thing here is this, Jesus offers forgiveness and life. Jesus offers you and I forgiveness and life. This is why this is a big, big deal. He told them in Luke 24, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead and on the third day and on repentance for the, forg- excuse me, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. It's what he came for, to forgive. Anybody here, could you use some forgiveness in your life? Yeah. Probably all of us, if we're honest. There's an old story, and if you attend the call church, you've heard this before, so I'm sorry to be repetitive. But there's a, uh, Ernest Hemingway shares this story about a man in Spain, a father and a son, and he loves his son, and his son gets a little frustrated. There's some division in the household, and his son takes off and heads to Spain, excuse me, to Madrid. And the father hears about that, and this strained relationship, and the dad is... He's frustrated, son just left, son just ran away, didn't say anything about it. There's been this strain for a while, and so his father goes to look for him in Spain. He can't find him after spending some time looking for him. He goes down to the local newspaper office, and he puts an ad in the paper. And his son's name is Paco. It says, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. And then the next day at noon, as the father was waiting, 800 Pacos showed up (laughs) seeking forgiveness. And I just wonder if maybe for you today, maybe for you, you would say, Brian, you don't have a clue what I've done in my life. You don't know where I've been. There's no way that a God a God of love could really love me. And I just want to tell you something, that at the cross, I think God says this. Meet me at the cross. You see, all is forgiven. And I love you. And it's what Easter is really all about. It's what Good Friday is all about. It's what we as Christians celebrate. That you have been offered forgiveness. You have been offered new life. God has given you an opportunity to start fresh and new. And for some of you, that's exactly where you need to be today. And you need to hear those words that Jesus died for you. But the second thing is there may be some of us in here that you're like, Brian, I know that story. But man, the last couple of months, the last couple of years of my life, I've been heading my own direction, doing my own thing. And your story is a lot like the story of Peter. If you remember Peter's story, Jesus, when he was on trial in front of the religious leaders, Jesus told Peter, he's like, hey, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, I would never deny you, Jesus. I'm in this to the end. I will die with you. And sure enough, three times Peter is asked, don't you know him? Aren't you one of his disciples? Three times he denies him. And on the third time in the Gospel of Luke, it says that on that third time in the rooster crows, that Jesus looked at Peter. Can you imagine that moment? He's denied him three times, which he thought he'd never do. And in that, Jesus looks right at him. And the crazy thing is we have no account before Jesus goes to the cross that Peter and Jesus had any kind of conversations. And do you think Peter felt guilty? You think Peter felt miserable? You think Peter felt about that big? I guarantee it. I wonder what that moment was like when Peter saw Jesus face to face after he had risen from the dead for the very first time. I wonder if it was like, God. I've blown it. I've messed up. Jesus, I'm so sorry. And maybe you're here today. And the crazy thing is, Jesus recommissions him. And he uses Peter to do tremendous things. You want to know why? Because God already knows. Can I tell you something? God already knows every detail of your life. 
He knows what you're going to do. He knows the things you're not going to do. That doesn't give us justification to go do whatever we want to do, but he knows that. And in the midst of that and all of the things that he knows, he says, I still sent my son for you to offer you forgiveness. Maybe you're like Peter. You've been running your own direction for years, months. You haven't been in church forever. And maybe today is a day of really evaluating, God, I, not only do I want your forgiveness, I want to be back into right, reconciled relationship with you once again, because I've missed that. And as one pastor said so well, if the journey to God is a thousand steps, he will take 999 of them and just leave one for you. And Maybe today God is just waiting for you to turn and make that one decision to say, God, I want to be back where you are and experience your forgiveness. But the second thing is, Jesus offers life. John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. And can we read this together? This is Jesus' words about himself. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Anybody here want full life? Okay, these three people. Anybody else want full life? I hope that you do. Jesus comes and offers that to us. He says, I want to give you fulfillment. I want to give you forgiveness. I want to use you for incredible purposes. And maybe you're here today going, I don't really sense that I've got a purpose in my life. Well, then you probably don't know Christ because he's got a purpose for you. You are created for a purpose and for a plan and for a reason. God's perfect plan, not yours, not the dreams that you have, but God has created you for a specific reason. When you enter into relationship with that, you begin to experience that fullness of life here. But not only is that the case, we have the promise of eternal life with him forevermore. Anybody looking forward to that? That day that we just sang about, Jesus is coming. He's going to take us home to be with him forevermore. I'm really looking forward to that day. Six people in the back are looking forward to that day. So the rest of you, we might need to talk more about what's going on here. But let me share with you this story. There's a father and son. They're driving down the road. They got their windows down. It's kind of a hot summer day. All of a sudden, a bee comes flying into the, to the vehicle. Well, the son is, is uh, deeply allergic to bee, deathly allergic to bee stings. And so he starts freaking out. He's trying to jump. He sees the bee. All of a sudden, the father sees what's going on with his boy. He knows the situation. In a moment of just cat-like reflexes, he reaches out and he grabs the bee. He catches it, and he just holds it in his hand for about 30 seconds. And as he's holding it, the son's like, what is he going to do? What is he going to do? And the father opens his hand. And the bee kind of flips out and is on the dash. And the boy is just freaking out. And he's screaming and yelling. And the dad says, son, relax. I took the sting. The bee is not capable of hurting you anymore. And I wonder if the truth of the matter is for all of us. If you have come to that place where you recognize that God has said, relax, my child. The sting that sin has produced, death, and an eternal separation, he has taken the sting of it, and it can't hurt you anymore. The Apostle Paul would write it this way, where, O death, is your victory, and where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have been set free. The sting of death is no longer there. Yes, you may die physically, but we have the promise of eternal life with him forevermore. And so what should my response be to that? Just want to give you a couple of responses here this morning. And we see it in the rest of Matthew chapter 8, 28, excuse me. The first is, I can reject him. Would you say that? I can reject him. You can. God's not going to force you into anything. Jesus is not going to plow his way into your life. And, and this takes place because in verse 11, we read what ends up transpiring here. It says, while the women were on their way, where are they going? They're going to tell the disciples which, by the way, when they go and tell the disciples, the disciples are like, oh, we don't believe you. Peter and John get into a running match, and they get to the tomb, and they kind of check things out, but they're still not quite convinced. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up on the scene, and then, oh, everything changes. But while the women are on their way, it says, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. I, I laugh at that. Some of the guards? What were the other guys? They were still passed out or uh, fear? Or maybe, maybe they said, hey, why don't some of you stay here in case something weird happens, maybe even more crazy than this, and we're going to go and talk to these religious leaders. And then it says this in verse 12. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night, stole him away while we were asleep. And if this report gets to the governor... We'll satisfy him, and we'll keep you out of trouble. These religious leaders wanted nothing to do with it. 
Here these guys come back saying there's an angel, a great earthquake, the stone was rolled away. We, maybe even some of them heard the voice, do not be afraid to the women. We, we don't know all the details, but they come back and report it, and immediately the chief priests want nothing to do with it. There are some of us here today, I hope not a ton of you, but when we talk about Jesus, you got dragged here by a family member. You don't even want to be here right now. You just want to get out. You're thinking, when is this chubby guy going to get done, right? And uh, we got another 75 minutes for you. No, I'm just kidding. We don't. But, but for you, it, it, it's not real. And, and I want to spend a moment to just ask you a question. If it's true, if it's really true, it changes everything. It means that Jesus is who he says he is, that he came to fulfill what he came to do. He fulfilled that. And that forgiveness is offered through him and him alone. And eternal life is offered through him and him alone. And it's something worth considering. And it might be time to evaluate your heart and say, man, I've been rejecting this for a long, long time. But what if it's true? The second response we can have is I can ignore him. I can ignore him. It says this in verse 15, so the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Hey, the disciples came, they stole his body, which we know is not true. I mean, Roman guards, to lose a, what they were looking after, they would lose their life. Falling asleep on the job, that's a big no-no. And then these disciples stole the body, overpowered a group of Roman soldiers? I don't think so. And, by the way, how do you know who stole them when you were sleeping anyway? How you, yeah, you're right. Doesn't make any sense. But the truth is, these guys saw it, and they accepted the bribe, and then they went and told everybody, yeah, he got stolen. But here's the problem. How did we find this out? You want to know what I believe? I believe somewhere along the line, some of those soldiers were like, man, I can't deny this anymore. And I'm wondering if there may be some of us here today that you keep ignoring God. There are circumstances in your life that just seem, ah, it's just happenstance. It's just lucky. It's just a crazy experience. And really, it's God speaking into your life. And it's time to stop ignoring him and time to start responding to him of this great news of the gospel. And I wonder if how many of us are just like that, one of those soldiers going, we got a million excuses. Maybe our world's gotten busy our life is just hectic. We got kids, we got games, we've got retirement, we've got what schooling, we got whatever. And I'm gonna tell you, if we're not careful, you miss out and we ignore the most important thing that you have been created for, a relationship with a God who loves you more than you will ever know. And maybe this Easter is a day of saying, man, I'm gonna stop ignoring. I'm gonna start responding and receiving, which is the last point here. I can believe and receive him. I can believe and receive him. Suddenly Jesus met them Greetings, he said, and the women came and they clasped his feet and they worshipped him. It's the step that I'm praying that most of us in this room have taken. My desire is that all of you would take that. Because there's some of us in here that are like, oh yeah, I believe Jesus died for my sins. And that's great, but have you received that? Have you received what he's done for you? Have you personally invited Christ to be a part of your life? To say, I want to give my life to you because you gave your life for me. And I want to receive your forgiveness and the life that only you can offer to me. Have you taken that step today? And so, I just conclude by saying this. For some of us, 2024, this Easter, it's a day of celebration. It really is. And I hope for, my desire is for every single one of this room, it's a day of celebration. Because you have been given new life in Jesus Christ. Your forget, sins have been forgiven. He has empowered you with not only eternal life, but life for today. And he has risen from the dead to prove he had the power to do exactly what he said he was going to do. And you are recipients of that. And your promise and your hope is an eternal life with him forevermore. This is a day to celebrate that. It is a great and a glorious day. Yes. But for some of you, it may be a day of reconciliation, which would be equally as great. Because you, you haven't been in tune with God for a long time. And today is a day of you just getting back on track to say, Lord, I want to be, I, I be where you are. I realize that maybe something out of this is just stirring your heart once again. And God is waiting for you. He's just waiting for you. And today is that day of coming to him and just saying, I want to be restored into a right relationship with you once again. I'd encourage you with that. Maybe for some of us, it's a day of consideration. 
Maybe you've been pushing this off for a long time. Oh, that's just some myth. There's some fairy tale, just some whatever. And I would, I would strongly encourage you to do some investigative work because let me just share this with you in love. If it's true, your eternity hinges on it. It's too important not to consider. And lastly, for some of us, maybe today is the day of life-changing transformation. That before you walk out of this place, you say, I want to believe and receive Jesus Christ into my life this Easter. I want to experience his forgiveness and the life that only he offers. I want to experience him in my life. And if that's you, in a moment, we're going to say a brief prayer that you can make that life-changing decision today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, I thank you for what we get to celebrate this day. Our Savior is not in a tomb. He's not in a grave. His body did not decay. But Jesus, you rose from the dead, and we rejoice in that. Father, for those of us who have put our faith in you, we have the promise of new life. We are forgiven. There is no more guilt. We are justified before you. There is no more shame. And we just thank you for that. And the promise of what you did back then in Jesus, you will do for us. We will be, we will live with you forever. Death has no sting any longer. And we rejoice in that. Father, I pray for some of us here this morning that maybe today is a day of reconciliation. That you even right now would be speaking into hearts. Just that you want a relationship once again to your, for your children who have turned to come back, to be a part of what you're doing, what you want to do in their lives, to stop running. And Lord, I pray that for those of us who are in that spot, we would do it. We would take that one step back to you because you're waiting there with open arms. God, for some of us who are here that maybe this is a one time a year thing that we think through, that maybe we'd walk out of here with a little bit more consideration. What if it's true? And what does that mean for me? God, I pray that maybe today would be the spark that leads us, some of us, to a place of really considering you for the very first time. And maybe you're here right now and you say today is the day a decision needs to be made and maybe you just sense God is speaking to you right in this moment. He's offering you forgiveness and he's offering you life. He's offering you a restored relationship with him. It's available. You just have to respond to it. And if that's you right now and you say, I want that. I want to experience Christ in my life and what he can do for me and what he has done for me. I would encourage you maybe to say a simple prayer like this in your heart. God, thanks for loving me. And right now, I do believe, Jesus, you died for me. I confess I'm a sinner. I've walked away from you. And Jesus, I ask right now that you would come into my life. I receive you and what you've done. Thanks for your forgiveness. Thanks for the price. And thanks that you have the power to do exactly what you said you would do. Change my life. Change my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.